Saints and the Saints. And um, today I need to leave on time uh, because my nephew has a poetry reading in Oakland at 3 p.m. And uh, this is his second book out from Norton and he's on a national tour and I missed the launch down in LA in September. Uh, so we are heading um, west um, pretty much right after class. Okay, so here we, we met Martin Luther last week. Hopefully you'd met him before. On the, on the right we have Philip Melanchthon. And I just wanted to contrast a little bit uh, for you the difference or the contributions that each of these great uh, men has made to the life of the Luther Lutheran Church. So if you can um, take a look at the chart up here. Can you all see the chart? Okay, um, I'm going to move it here in front of the pictures, just a second, so Catherine can grab it. Oh, that won't work. Oh. There. Okay, now Catherine can get it. All righty, let's uh, talk about who they were and what uh, contributions they made to the life of the Lutheran Church. Okay, uh, Martin Luther translated the Bible into German, or Deutsch, um, from Hebrew and from uh, Greek texts. He was uh, temperamentally a polemical theologian. He was a polemicist. He was a fighter. And he was constantly writing tracts against things, against Erasmus, against the Pope. He was fighting, okay? That was his a temperamental nature, okay? And he was also, by temperament, a biblical theologian. He started with the Bible and then he went out from there. He was an educator. He wrote the small catechism for the lay people and the large catechism for the pastors to educate people as to what they believed. And he reformed uh, the order of worship. Our order of worship is still rather similar to the order that Luther developed in the 16th century. He was a hymn writer, and his famous hymn is A Mighty, a Mighty Fortress, and then he also wrote a very famous uh, Christmas hymn. Um, from heaven above to earth below. That's also written by Martin Luther. And he was also a famous preacher. Okay, Philip Melanchthon was temperamentally a very different type of person. He was an apologist. Okay, so he was somebody who tried to find mesh points, points of similarity. Okay, so that uh, he could keep working. So he was a bridge builder, you might say. Okay? We could use some good bridge builders right now, I would say. And I, by temperament, he was a systematic theologian. He wrote the Apology to the Augsburg Confession as well as the Augsburg Confession, which is really, both documents are essentially systematic outlay, outlines of, of the Lutheran understanding of the faith. And he also reformed the educational system in northern Germany. Okay? Well, what does that mean, he reformed it? What, what, he what was it and what did it become? He reformed the way they taught um, classroom education in terms of going to school. Um, so that's, um, he was extraordinarily busy doing that. Now, do any of you have any idea what a systematic theologian does? Okay, so if I, John, can you come help me flip this board here? I feel like Vanna White. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Alrighty, this is what we do in systematic theology. 
Okay, we always start with God, Theos, and they use these symbols because you're writing all the time, okay? So this is a Greek theta for Theos, for God, and that's called theology. This is a key uh, in Greek for Christ, and that's Christology. And in Christology, we talk about two aspects of Christ. The nature of Jesus Christ, the human and the divine, or the incarnation, and we talk about the work of Jesus Christ, or how we're saved. Okay, then this is a P, a pneuma for spirit, and that's the Holy Spirit. Then we talk about the Trinity, because at the time of the early church, there was great controversy as to whether or not we were actually a monotheistic religion, or a tritheistic religion. So we talk about the Trinity. Then we talk about anthropology, or the nature of man, okay? Man and women, as woman, as they would say today. And then generally you talk about uh, the church, ecclesia, or ecumenism. Then um, we would probably talk about the place of scripture, and authority, what's the final authority in the church? Um, we talk about ethics. We talk about the sacraments, worship, and eschatology. These are some of the main points. Eschatology means end times. What happens at the end of the world? Um, those are, that's what a systematic theologian does. And hopefully, at the end of the day, it all ties together in a coherent manner. Okay. Uh, the pi symbol was uh, used there on, on one of those. Did that have any reference to the, the, the circle completed? Uh, uh, no, it has no. It's just the first letter of Holy, Holy Spirit in the Greek. Okay, thank you. Okay. <coughs> Um, and because they're writing so much, you know, if you take a class, they'll just always use the abbreviations, not the... There we go. Yeah, but it's not very bright. It's coming. It's coming? Yeah, it's coming. <laughs> Shine on. <laughs> Shine on, Silver Moon. Okay, well, um, Philip will, Melanchthon will get lighter as we move along. Okay, Melanchthon um, is commemorated in the uh, Lutheran Church on the date of the presentation of the Augsburg Confession, which was June 25th, uh, 1560. Um, he had died just prior to that, but that's the date of his commemoration. Um, and we talked about what he did, and uh, this is a portrait of uh, Philip Melanchthon by Hans Holbein. He amazingly had portraits made of him by three of the greatest portraitists of the 16th century, uh, Kronach, Holbein, and the third one would be Albrecht Dürer. Albrecht Dürer was a friend of um, Melanchthon's. This is by far the best representation of what he looked like. Um, and Dürer was a superb artist, and he did this with just a woodcut. That's how good this guy was. Okay, here, just to show you, is uh, Martin Luther and Philip Melanchthon and the crucifixion. And I just wanted to show you the symbols. Um, here is the Luther rose. On the left is a Philip symbol, on the white part up there. Here we have a crucifix, crucifixion scene. And um, Luther's animal is the swan. Okay, last week um, we had Jan Hus, um, and actually his symbol was a goose. Your goose is cooked, he was burnt. <laughs> okay. But uh, Luther's symbol is a swan. Why such a stout-looking uh, German with such a severe-looking or serious chin um, got to be a swan is um, uh, interesting to me. 
Okay, well, I hope you liked our little sideline excursion into theology, and now we're going to get down to art. All of these artists are actually commemorated on the date of Albert Durer's death, which is April 6th. And they're all listed in your hymnal under commemorations on either page 16 or 17 at the front. And we have Albrecht Durer, Matthias Grunwald, and Lucas Cronach the Elder. So in the 16th century, Lutherans um, responded to the rest of the world with um, the visual arts, and we move into music in the 17th and 18th centuries. So let us pray. Almighty God, beautiful in majesty, majestic in holiness, you have shown us the splendor of creation in the work of your servants, Lucas Cranach the Elder, Albrecht Durer, and Matthias Grunwald. Teach us to drive from the world all chaos and disorder, that our eyes may behold your glory, and that at last everyone may know the inexhaustible richness of your new creation in Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Okay. Here we have uh, Durer's uh, famous um, four, the Four Apostles, and we also have one of his self-portraits. He painted himself uh, numerous times, and he painted himself very well. Um, there's a very interesting um, article in the New York Times about this particular painting um, that was done during the pandemic that's very, very superb. So if you have, if you subscribe to that um, um, publication, I'd suggest looking it up. It's really fun. Let's talk about the four apostles. Uh, can we identify these four apostles at all? Do you have any idea which ones are on the wall? Okay, well, okay, Ernie says John on the left, okay? I thought he was on the right in white. Uh, okay, well, I'm going to put him on the left. Okay. John um, is always presented in Western art as having long blonde hair and being young and beautiful. Okay. He's the best looking of the apostles, he's the youngest, and he has long blonde hair. That's a dead giveaway whenever you see a presentation, unless it's an etching or a black and white. John is always the best looking, okay? All righty. Um, and then behind him, the guy holding a key. Do you have any idea who that is? St. Peter, okay? On this rock, I will build my church. And behind... Um, well, the guy in white. Who's the figure in white? Who, who, wrote, who wrote Romans? St. Paul, right? This is St. Paul. Okay, and we know that uh, because St. Paul is holding two, of, two pieces of his iconography. One is a book, as the writer of many of the epistles in the New Testament. And the other is the sword, because he dies by the sword. As a Roman citizen, he could not be crucified for being a, a, a Christian. He had to be uh, beheaded. That was his right as a Roman citizen. And behind Paul, the guy holding the scroll, do you have any idea who he is? Okay. Uh, well, it's not Matthew, it's Mark. Okay. So let's delve into why these four are here. Okay, so, um, Luther's favorite evangelist or gospel writer was, uh, was St. John. Okay, and if you can actually, you know, if you're up close to this and you can read German and you can read old script German, um, the book here, the Bible, is open to uh, the Gospel of John. And it's open uh, in German, in Luther's translation. Um, and it reads, let me see. Am Anfang war das Wort. Okay, healthy, do you, do you know what that means? 
In the beginning was the word. You got it. Okay. So that is the first line of, of John's gospel. Okay, bonus points for anyone who knows when we're going to hear this gospel in church next. Christmas. You win. <laughs> Hands down. That was fast. Uh, John 1 is the text, uh, one of the texts appointed for every Christmas Eve, and it's um, heard most regularly. Okay. So he's uh, reading from John 1, which is the text for Christmas Eve. Um, and he's reading from the Luther Bible. Okay, so Melanchthon is throwing his hand. You know, he's saying, I'm Lutheran. I'm not Catholic. If it were, you know, if he were Catholic, it would be a different presentation of, of Gospels. So behind, okay, in the second plane, as they talk about this in the art books I've read, uh, we see St. Peter. Okay, so St. Peter, on this rock I will build my church. St. Peter is essentially the first pope. That's where the whole idea of the Western papacy comes from. So notice that he's smaller. He's holding the key, but he's looking at the book. Okay, so in some senses, Malank, or here, um, Durer is saying that the, the, uh, the place for authority has moved from the church, from the Pope, to the book. Okay? And here we have St. Paul. And do we know what uh, verses in Romans um, caused uh, Martin Luther to... 1-8. Uh, what? One eight. Okay, I've got one sixteen here for today. Uh, for I am not ashamed of the gospel; it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who has faith, to the Jew first and also the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed through faith for faith, as it is written, "The one who is righteous will live by faith." Okay, but John, what? Which? Okay, well that okay, that's fine. It's in Romans one. You were, you were, darn close. Okay, um, and here Paul is quoting um, from the book of Habakkuk, which is an Old Testament um, book on, on one of the minor prophets, but it's his own language from Habakkuk. And uh, behind Paul, we have Saint Mark, who's also smaller. And he is considered to be the roughest of the, um, you know, the gospel writers. And um, can someone close that door? So they're having too good a time up there for coffee hour. <laughs> um, and he's holding a scroll. And uh, St. Uh, Mark's gospel, the shortest, only 16 chapters. So next year is the year of Mark. We'll hear a lot of, of the gospel of John. Um, it begins with this for these words the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ the Son of God it's a short sweet direct proclamation of uh, the coming of Jesus Christ yes John a clarifying old question for me I've been told that the different Gospels were targeted to different audiences and that for example Mark was addressed to the Gentiles in general that's true and you know, that's, uh, that, there have been many theories as to why each of them were written, and that is uh, one of the common theories that's been um, used in parlance. Um, Mark, uh, the study of Mark has been, uh, gotten a lot of uh, attention in the 20th century, especially there was a German uh, biblical theologian by the name of Martin de Valius, who totally revolutionized the study of Mark. And um, uh, Mark was my father's favorite gospel, and he wrote a thesis on that. Um, so um, there was a, there's been a lot of work done on the gospel of Mark. Okay. All righty. So now maybe you've noticed or not noticed uh, these little scribbles at the bottom of the screen here. 
I think it's probably difficult for you to see them. Okay, so some of them you can see, and some of them are, you know, I can hardly read them. I need to be up close with a microscope um, to actually see them up front. But this uh, painting was uh, painted by uh, Durer and actually given to the city of Nuremberg as a present, and they gave him a hundred golden, you know, he, he got paid richly for this. Um, but um, there was a point at which these, this painting was moved to Munich. And in the old days, or even still, Nuremberg was a hotbed of Protestant activity, and Munich is in Bavaria, and it's extraordinarily Catholic. There's a church, a big church on every corner. Um, so when it got moved to uh, Munich, in Munich, they cut the bottoms off. And it was only in the 20th century that they were put on, and it now is at the um, Alta Pinakothek. Um, so let me explain to you why they might have done such a, a dastardly deed. Okay, and um, Durer had a calligrapher uh, do this work, so he paid somebody to do this work. And at the bottom of both panels of the diptych are quotations from Luther's Bible as follows. One's from 2 Peter, uh, which warns against false teachers and prophets, as does the reading from 1 John 4. Then uh, there is a reading from first, or 2 Timothy chapter 3, which warns against rampant immorality. This one's very... Um, speaks to my heart right now. You must understand this, that in the last days distressing times will come, for people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, bolsters, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, inhuman, implacable slanderers, profligates, brutes, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to the outward form of godliness, but denying its power. Avoid them. For among them are those who make their way into households and captivate silly women, overwhelmed by their sins and swayed by all kinds of desires, who are always being instructed and can never arrive at a knowledge of the truth. And there is also a reading from Mark 12, which warns against uh, religious hypocrites. Okay. Beware the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and be greeted um, with respect in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. Okay. So you can see why when this moved to Munich, they might lock that off. <laughs> okay. So in one of the books that I read um, on Durer at uh, the Crocker Library, it talked about an original uh, purpose for these two panels of saints. And you know we've looked at a lot of altarpieces in the last couple weeks, or even last year too, we looked at a lot of altarpieces. And as you recall, there are usually uh, side panels of saints on either ones of the, on these altarpieces. So it is thought by the art historians that Durer had originally conceived of these two panels actually with different saints. Uh, so he changed up the saints when he really got to be a Protestant. Um, but that they would have surrounded a piece of art called a Sacra Conversazione, or a Sacred contra uh, Conversation, with the Virgin and Child at the center, surrounded by a group of saints. And this is a typical kind of artwork found in Italy in the 14th and 15th century, and Durer had made two trips to Italy, so of the three artists we're looking at today, Durer is the artist most <coughs> closely associated with the Italian Renaissance because he'd actually been there 
to go and look and see what they're doing. He's a, really a remarkable figure in German art. So this would totally change up our understanding, our reading of the pictures, but since it was done just as two panels and not as an altarpiece, uh, we now have a declaration of really Durer's um, commitment to the Protestant cause. So he really threw his hat in, and he, that was really sort of the end of his gaining commissions from the Catholic Church. <laughs> okay. Here we meet our second uh, great uh, German artist of this era, a gentleman by the name of Matthias Grunwald. And I'm sure I'm not saying that properly, but it essentially means green wood, okay? Oh, someone's making noise in that back staircase, too. And on the left here, we have a portrait in chalk, heightened with white, of uh, St. John the Evangelist, uh, done by uh, Grunwald in 1512, somewhere between 1512 and 1514. And it was long thought to be a self-portrait of the artist, and then it was later identified as actually being uh, St. John. So that's an approximate um, understanding of what people thought he looked like for many years. And this would be his signature, or the insignia that he put on all of his paintings. And here we have a stunningly beautiful um, stupa of Madonna which was uh, one of, um, um, let me find the right page, one of his most glorious works. I especially like this one. So he portrays, what are we seeing when we look at this? It's pretty tough to avoid that. The, the two figures in the, in the center uh, but in, in looking at the entire painting, there's much more detail in the background work than there is in the features of the people to which the eye is drawn because of the color. Yeah. Um, there's sort of a generic Madonna and child in a glorified setting um, with a beautiful landscape or townscape in the back. And on the right here, we have a church. And that, according to the art historians, is an accurate representation of oh, this. Let me move to the next slide here. Oh, of uh, Strasbourg Cathedral. And this is uh, the Portal of the Virgin right here. Um, and I think that's probably the, the portal that um, uh, Grunewald chose to put in the painting, but I'm, I'm not sure it uh, was the closest image that I could find online. I would actually have to go there and walk around and take pictures of the every side, uh, but I didn't have time to do that before this class. <laughs> <laughs> so let's look at some of the icons. Yes, Mark? Well, I was just going to say, in film, I think they call it pointing to the plot when you see little things. Okay. So this is the Eisenheim altarpiece. This is Grunholm's, Grunwald's most famous piece. Um, and Helvi, have you seen it? Yeah, yeah. It's actually in Colmar, which is in France now. It's uh, located in Alsace. And Alsace has been traded between Germany and France more times uh, than anyone could possibly remember. Now it happens to be in France, but it's just sort of happenstance. The map, the map changes, and that's where it is now. So what do we notice about uh, this painting? Who is the dominant figure? Christ. And how do we know that? He's in the center. How does his size compare to the other people? He's much bigger, right? Okay. Uh, the Eisenheim altarpiece was actually painted for an order of monks called the Order of Saint Anthony, 
which was founded in about the uh, 13th, 14th century. They got a papal dispensation to found this order. And they were, uh, they bear resemblance to three different types of monks um, because they get, they raise money a bit like the mendicant, mendicant uh, monks. They have liturgical worship like a different type of monks. And then they um, care for people who are ill, like the hospitalers. Okay, so they, um, they're an unusual order at this time. And in northern Germany at this time, there is a plague of what's called rye ergotism, which is also known as St. Anthony's fire. And these monks, at where this painting was commissioned for, have a huge hospital where they are treating people who are suffering from this actually terrible disease, which comes in two forms, a convulsive form and a gangrenous form. And people, limbs turned, turned black and fell off. I mean, so they specialized by hiring uh, surgeons to come in and do um, amputations um, so that they could um, cure people. And they did have a certain amount of success. But it's an incredibly painful skin disease, um, full of hallucinations, convulsions, and then these uh, terrible sores um, where your body finally turned black and you died. It was a horrible, horrible disease. Yeah. Um, but it happened quickly. So um, it is thought that the monks commissioned this painting or this altarpiece. Um, um, who are the people surrounding Jesus at the bottom? They're much smaller in size. Um, but who are we looking at? Mary. We're looking at Mary. And who's the blonde? Okay, John, okay, the beloved disciple. I gave that one away, dead away. <laughs> okay, um, kneeling here in prayer is Mary Magdalene. And standing up on the right, John the Baptist. Okay, good call, ladies, there. And John the Baptist is bearing a Bible. And the words that are written here, I must decrease so he may increase. Okay. That and um, we also have a lamb or an Agnus Dei at the bottom. Question. Yes. Uh, yeah, my mother was an artist. She said that there was no way that Christ could have been crucified with the nails through the palm. It would have just ripped out. That he had to be nailed uh, through the wrist. Yeah. Okay. And any discussion you have to that? Yes. No, I. Um, it may very well be accurate. Um, I don't. I prefer not to go into the to the gore associated with the crucifixion because I just don't sleep at night. Yeah. Yeah. It's too bloody and it's too painful. You know, the, the black sky is also a very dramatic uh, uh, background here. It it highlights the body more than a blue sky or even ki any kind of fair sky. The black is very impactful. Yeah, thank you, Ernie. And there's an important word, I think, that's used both in music and in art. C-H-I-A-R-O-S-C-U-R-O. -O. You say... Oh, chiaroscuro. Chiaroscuro. Yes. Okay, which is the contrast between light and dark, or soft and large. Yes. Um, and mm -hmm. it's used, those, that term is used both in uh, musicology and also in art. And... Um, Grunewald uses that a lot in his art. Um, so um, notice all the men in red, okay? So let me fill in why um, the artist chose to include these two saints on the side panels. On the left, we have Saint uh, Sebastian, who was shot dead with arrows, okay? Yeah, and he's uh, tied to the pillar here. Both of these saints are standing on pedestals, um, which are painted actually in what's called Grisail, G-R-I-S-A-I-L-L-E. Um, they're grayscale. 
Um, but they also appear to be live, not dead saints. So they're painted as sort of living figures. So Saint Sebastian is uh, the patron saint of plagues and epidemics. So that's, uh, that's a perfect reason for why he would be painted for this hospital. On the right, we have St. Anthony, and we met St. Anthony in week one of our class, St. Anthony of the Desert, because St. Anthony was the patron order of this particular uh, group of saints. We have um, St. or we have St. John the Baptist on the right, and uh, St. John the Baptist is considered to be the fulfillment of the Old Covenant in medieval, early um, European um, iconography in terms of art. And St. John would be herald in the age of the New Covenant. So we have an end to the Old Covenant and we have a beginning of the New Covenant. Um, and that's the iconography uh, behind, uh, the port behind this particular choice of saints and presentation in uh, the painting. What do we have below? This is called the pridello, uh, the stand on which uh, um, the skin condition, you know, the condition of Christ's skin. You can see the thorns and the spikes in his arms here. It's a pretty grisly uh, scene. But the, I also included this piece, which is part of another part of the Eisenheim altarpiece, because we just saw a very small portion of it. Um, this is actually a portrayal of what ergotism looks like. This is someone suffering with St. Anthony's fire. It's a terrible condition. Okay, so this is another portrayal of uh, St. Anthony's temptations. If you remember the first week of class, we saw that beautiful painting by Michelangelo. Uh, this is another rendition of the temptations of St. Anthony. Okay. Now, we have St. Maurice. And we have two uh, presentations of St. Maurice, both of which were commissioned by the same patron, Albrecht of Brandenburg, um, who's a member of the Hohenzollern family, actually. We have um, St. Maurice on the left by Cranach, and we have uh, the meeting of Saints Erasmus and Maurice on the right by Matthias Grunwald. Okay, well, they were both commissioned by Albrecht of uh, Brandenburg, who had a huge collection of relics in a town called Halle. He had like 8,000 relics, and uh, Frederick uh, the Wise in uh, Saxony had 18,970. They had a little competition going <laughs> to see who could get more pilgrims to come to make sure that uh, you could get you know, more and more, fewer years in purgatory. One of them had a reliquary worth 19 million years in purgatory. Okay? And there was money involved in this, okay? So, yeah. So this is um, uh, St. Maurice. And St. Maurice was the patron saint of um, Halle and also the patron saint of the Hohenzollern family. He's also the patron saint of the Habsburgs or the Holy Roman Empire. Okay, so he has two presentations. So he's represented in this um, cathedral in Halle many, many times because um, Albrecht liked to commission a lot of art. There, are multiple, there were multiple altarpieces to St. Maurice. And Cranach's representation is actually a representation of one of the legions. And they were uh, pulled from their regular post in North Africa um, up into Europe. And during one of the persecutions, uh, the emperor decided this is before the conversion of Constantine, that he was going to kill all the Christians in this part of, of Europe. And, um, St. Maurice refused to do that, as did his legion, all of whom were Christians. So eventually, uh, the emperor got tired of having disobedient soldiers, and he just had them all um, 
um, hacked to death with swords. So he dies by the sword, which is one of his emblems. And St. Erasmus died in one of the persecutions of uh, the emperor Diocletian. Okay. Yeah. Yes, there's a certain color to the same brain state. Is it, is it just because it's the color of the wood, or was he actually a person of color? It is thought, you know, he was a Thebe, he was from Thebes. Um, it is thought that he was from uh, Africa, and he was always presented um, in, um, in art as a black person. Okay. So nowadays we would read him differently, um, but um, you know he's a black saint, um, and we would notice the blackness first rather than noticing the whole history of things. But what I'm trying to point out to you is that both of these artists worked both sides of the street. They worked both for the Protestants and they worked for the Catholics. Okay, so they're. They're artists with pens for hire. <laughs> okay. This is Lucas Cranach the Elder. Uh, Cranach is the artist most closely associated with Martin Luther. This is a portrait of him as actually a very old man. He died at the age of 77. Um, so he gets to live a very long life or maybe he dies a little bit later because it, it's before he dies. Um, uh, Cranach, um, I think he looks like the most contemporary man of all the faces that we've seen now. If he actually you know, trimmed up his beard and walked into church, I think we all just assume that he was a modern man. Um, but he might have to change his clothes, but... Um, but he looks very modern, and he's staring right at us. He has a, he has a solid countenance, you might say, a calm you, look to him. Do you have an explanation or a reason why the beard is showing two points? And this is very common in, in some of the paintings that we've seen this morning, that the beard is split uh, and divided and going off in, uh, quote, two different directions. And that may very well have been the style of uh, facial presentation at that time. There is a book on um, that I'm very interested in getting on uh, style in the 16th century Europe, um, especially in northern Germany. Um, I just haven't had uh, time to read any more about that, but um, there, are, there are books about fashion is getting a, a lot of attention at this time. And on the right, we have an illustration of the creation by Cranach's workshop for the Luther Bible. Um, the Luther Bible was uh, given an illustrated edition, and the illustrations were done uh, by Cranach's workshop. And uh, this is what they looked like in a colorized version. And I have a copy of the book. Um, it's, I mean, they illustrated the entire um, the entire Bible. It's sort of fun. And here we have uh, one of his most stunningly beautiful pieces, um, Adam and Eve, uh, which is in London. Um, what are we noticing about this piece? Small fig leaves. <laughs> Small fig leaves, okay. The number of apples on the tree, I'm, I'm surprised. I'm, I thought the apple could be presented uh, more iconically uh, as being very different from all of the other trees. Well, um, there are, a, you know, that's a heavy laden tree and they all look to be perfectly ripe yes. um, at exactly the same time. Yes. Um, they look like they're ready to be uh, picked and um, let's make up some pie and some apple butter. <laughs> um, okay. Um, and this was um, a, a legitimate reason to portray nudity. You could portray nudity either in a biblical scene, where it was... Uh, 26. This elegant and harmonious painting was actually made at a time of considerable religious upheaval in Europe. The date carved into the tree, 1526, 
was actually just nine years after Martin Luther had initiated the Protestant Reformation. Lucas Cranach the Elder worked for much of his life at the royal court in Saxony. Here he was at the centre of the Reformation and knew Martin Luther personally. This scene, taken from the book of Genesis, would have been designed as much for pleasure as for instruction. Lucas Cranach has chosen to take the pivotal moment from the story of Adam and Eve, but as soon as Adam bites into the apple, they will be cast out of the Garden of Eden and become ashamed of their nakedness. We can see that Cranach has tried to give the scene contemporary resonance by making the figures look very Northern European. Their pale skin and Eve's red hair would have related to early 16th century viewers. Even Eve's hairstyle would have been very contemporary. Cranach, we know from x-rays made by the conservation department here at the Courthold, took great care to get the hands and the position of the fingers exactly right. This type of art would also have been acceptable to Cranach's patrons and friends because it had removed all the magical elements that were associated with Catholic art. There are no flying angels, halos, or golden rays. Although it's a very stylized scene, it is essentially a natural scene. Even the snake, which represents the devil, and might normally be shown with a devil's head or even a woman's head, appears as just a normal snake. The technique of this painting is remarkable for its level of detail. Lucas Cranach has painted every individual blade of grass and every leaf on the tree and the hedges behind. The image was rich in symbolism for its early viewers who would have had a very good understanding of the Bible. Hidden right at the center of the image is a grapevine, perhaps at a glance might look like a normal fig leaf disguising Adam and Eve's genitals, but actually on closer inspection we can see grapes and this represents wine and the blood of Christ. So what Lucas Cranach has cleverly done is he's shown that although things are about to go wrong at this particular moment, Christ will come later on in the story and put things right. Other symbols, particularly within the animals. This is the last painting we'll look at, and we'll look at it quickly. Um, it's a marvelous crucifixion scene by Cranach, um, but we're getting on towards the end. Um, and this is the church where it is. Um, here we have a crucifixion. Um, we have um, Martin Luther on the right. We have Cranach to his left wearing the fur robe. We have John the Baptist. We have the Agnus Dei um, holding a banner that says, uh, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Uh, we have Christ here, the resurrected Christ who's stomping on death and the devil. And we have a death uh, chasing a man into the fires of purgatory here. We have Moses and uh, the Ten Commandments here. Here we have a scene from Numbers 21, uh, which is also uh, prefigures Christ. It is uh, the uh, bronze serpent. Do you all remember that? Okay, well, we'll have to have a refresher course on numbers at some time. And at uh, the top here, we have the Annunciation to the Shepherds, which is another reading for Christmas Eve. Um, I, um, this is our closing slide, and we'll get there in a second. But I want to thank all of you for coming to class these last weeks. This has been a joy to teach, and... I hope we have another chance uh, to have a class again this spring.